Bonjour à tous, merci de nous rejoindre pour Good morning le everyone. Forum. Thank un you for joining us at this borders forum. This is a very special forum during a year that is out of the ordinary with coronavirus and all the questions around borders. Cross border territories were longer seen as a places where we could try out things for the European integration. There was nice labs after 35 Five years of free movement in the Schengen areas, 30 years of interreg in order to support territories and to coordinate them, 10 years of the EGTC platform. Where do we stand now with our ambition to abolish and to remove borders? We are going to try and answer this question during this virtual forum organized by the European Commission, by MOT and by the Committee of the Regions. There are going to be four roundtables with high-level guests that they are going to answer my questions, but most and foremost your questions. I invite you to ask your questions during the discussions. All you have to do is to download the Slido app with the hashtag Borders Forum. The event is being interpreted into English, French and German. Let me say a few words about this initiative first that is a, a one of its kind initiative. We will have a minister, a commissioner, a president of a, a, a committee of the region. So we are first going to watch this video before we start our first round table. Plus exactement, so, let me say a few things about our main speakers today. Uh, we have a woman with us this morning, Mrs. Elisa Ferrer, you are Commissioner in charge of Cohesion and Reforms. You used to be the Portuguese Minister in charge of Planning and the Environment. We would like to listen to what you have to say about this crisis and the solutions provided by uh, the cohesion policies when it comes to borders and cross-border issues. Issues. Ah, euh, nous avons un petit problème de son. It seems there is a sound issue, Mrs. Ferreira. Il faut juste allumer votre micro. So please, you have to turn on your mic so that we can hear you. Now we can hear you better, much better. Yes, it was off. So Elisa Ferreira, a European Commission in charge of cohesion. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, dear President, uh, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it is really a great pleasure for me to greet you, all of you, at this first uh, ever Border Forum. My gratitude goes to our French hosts, and it comes with my deepest sympathies for the French people at this difficult moment. The recent terrorist attacks in Paris and Nice have shocked uh, excuse me. The recent terrorist attacks in Paris and Nice have shocked and moved me profoundly. My heart, my heart is with those citizens that have lost their loved ones. The values that you are defending now represent essential European values that we all share around our union. France and all other countries for that matter, like most recently Austria, do not stand alone. We are all together. At this forum, we will see the amazing richness of cross-border cooperation in the European Union. The COVID crisis has demonstrated with force that borders remain an important issue of public interest and of public debate. How do we manage borders in a public health crisis? How do we ensure that our important cooperation in healthcare, in connectivity and in innovation is not suddenly 
interrupted at the borders. This year also marks an important anniversary. It's the 30 years of Interreg. We have come a long way and we can be proud of it. When Interreg started, it was 1990. The main objective was to support regions along internal borders, mainly, let's be frank, to implement the single market. But since then, we have built an instrument an instrument that brings people together for more than 30 countries, member states and also neighboring countries. And this connection, this interconnection, is meant to tackle all kinds of current challenges across our borders. The network we have created is truly impressive. More than 100 programs across land borders, sea borders, including larger territorial spaces and with our pre-accession partners and neighbor countries. I want to pay tribute to all of you for this important European achievement. And I pay particular tribute to those who have been willing to experiment and who have taken the initiative to reach further. I also pay tribute to the European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation when we introduced this idea back in 2006, there was enthusiasm, but also some skepticism. You have confounded the skeptics. Today, we have around 80 successful groupings, some of whom have played a key role in tackling the COVID crisis. The groupings form an important pillar in cross-border cooperation. Today, we must look ahead and debate the key challenges in front of us. First of all, the continued political relevance of borders. Earlier this year, during the first confinement, when borders closed sometimes overnight, we realized how much our European livelihood depends on open borders. Some were prevented from working, some from seeing family, some from accessing healthcare facilities, we must draw the necessary lessons from these experiences. Borders continue to be the testing ground of our European ambitions. We must not forget that a great deal of public goods, such as transport, access to energy, jobs, healthcare, transcend borders. None of these European public goods should be blocked by a border. I strongly believe that cross-border issues matter and need attention. We analyzed it in the last communication from 2017, before the COVID crisis, on the, when we addressed the boosting EU border regions. And we'll prepare a new communication now. Cooperation with regional organizations such as the Benelux Union and the Nordic Council of Ministers also is of key importance. And of course, we welcome, we welcome and encourage national initiatives, such as the Treaty of Aachen, uh, for cooperation between France and Germany. When we speak about borders, we cannot overlook the new external border we will soon have with the United Kingdom. I am satisfied that the British authorities will continue with the peace program in Northern Ireland. But at the same time, I very much regret their unwillingness to continue with other interreg programs. Some programs will even disappear. They lost sense and are currently, and we are currently working to find fallback solutions whenever possible. This brings me to my second issue where we must work together. The financial means available. With fewer resources available, we will need to concentrate our actions and prioritize them. Concentration means focus on high added value activities, projects that will really change border life in the long term. This means a strong focus on the twin transition as well. Interreg must promote Europe's transition to a green economy, and I am glad that the thematic concentration in new, new, new legislation 
will provide the necessary framework. And, uh, but we must also uh, be more digital, more innovative, and the new interregional innovation tool will help us to reach that goal as well. We are looking then for focus, focus for clear value added. Concentration also means a focus on the territories where we need change most and on the territories that have the weakest capacity and means to do it by themselves. This is the principle of cohesion policy. We have to make sure that we find the best solutions for the new architecture of our programs in cross-border as well as in transnational cooperation. My third point is the importance of technical assistance. There is an old saying from the military field. It says, amateurs discuss strategy, experts discuss logistics. For us, this means that it is not enough to have a good overall plan and sufficient funds. But in order to succeed, we also need solid implementation. As European institutions, we promote the sharing across Europe of knowledge and of experience. Border regions often face similar problems. They should not have to reinvent the wheel each time. Let's exchange experience. Let's make the best of our cooperation. We have developed an online platform for practitioners, for people that are on the ground to exchange experiences. This tool is user-friendly and contains a wealth of practical information. And we offer more support through so-called B solutions, which goes for border solutions tool. Through this, we make legal and technical expertise available in transport, in healthcare, data exchange, or reclamers and skills. We have already completed more than 40 cases. All this is taken care of by a dedicated team inside the Gerigio. The, we call it the border focal point. So I invite you to contact them. If you have specific questions, specific needs, let's work together. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, border cooperation matters more than ever before. For 30 years, you have provided practical solutions in order to overcome border obstacles. You have been working at the forefront of European integration. But the mission is not accomplished. I want to encourage you to continue, to, to continue with your dedication and efforts in the future. You are building Europe every day, looking ahead. In the middle of Europe's second confinement, we have learned the value of open borders. With your experiences, we will draw the right conclusions. Thank you for your support, and I wish you a successful forum. I wish all of us keep healthy, and let's go on working and sharing experiences. And my last word, a compliment to the organizers, in particular to the Committee of Regions and also to the MOT in the French framework. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. You will stay with us for the discussion that will follow. Uh, we also have another participant who is going to say a few words. Apostolos Tsitsikostas, you are the president of the European Committee of the Regions, a former governor of Central Macedonia in Greece. The Committee of the Regions uh, acts as a spokesperson for the territories. So, what is its message? today at the midst of this pandemic. Thank you very much uh, for your invitation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be participating in this uh, forum this morning. Dear Commissioner Ferreira, dear President uh, Dupse, uh, dear representatives of the European groupings for territorial cooperation and of border regions, let me start by saying that uh, my heart, uh, my thoughts, uh, are with you in France uh, with all the difficulties that you're facing 
from terrorism to the corona pandemic, uh, new wave, which is very harsh in your country. And uh, please know that uh, we, the Committee of the Regions, and personally myself, we are committed in helping in any way we can. Dear colleagues, many Europeans have no longer any perception of borders within Europe. Visas and border checks, different currencies and limitations to living and working in other member states are unknown to new generations and a remote memory for those who experienced that world. However, already in 2015 and 2016, the immigration crisis had put considerable pressure on the Schengen Agreement, raising concerns about its future and making even some citizens and politicians question the future and the usefulness of cross-border and transnational cooperation. While we were eventually leaving these difficulties behind us, the COVID-19 crisis shook our way of life in an unprecedented way. With the pandemic, we found ourselves caught by the past again, and borders were closed, unfortunately, overnight. The COVID-19 platform set up by the Committee of the Regions gathered an impressive series of cross-border projects that show the potential impact of cross-border cooperation on Europe's recovery and resilience. From tailored e-training programs shared by Alpine regions to the border info points supporting commuters between Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, from many stories of cooperation on health services to those regions jointly monitoring the crisis impact on their economies, cross-border cooperation was an important part of EU regions' reaction to this pandemic. Despite these efforts, many citizens in border regions were unable to go to work, receive medical treatment, or even be able to see their loved ones, sometimes only a few kilometers away. And also business sectors that rely on workforce coming from the other side of their border, like health, elderly care, or agriculture risked a total collapse. So this forum should help answering the needs of those citizens and their businesses. This timely and precious opportunity must help strengthen the awareness of the vital role of cross-border cooperation in Europe, consolidate its achievements, and look ahead to what still needs to be done to those who call for a retreat into isolation, for falling back behind national borders, we need to answer by showing that EU internal borders are not barriers, but laboratories for unity, enhancing resilience, fostering dialogue, and accelerating the green transition. This work, ladies and gentlemen, cannot be peripheral in the European Union and the national agendas. Internal border regions cover 40% of the Union's territory, accounting for 30% of its population and hosting almost 2 million of cross-border commuters. Millions of European citizens and businesses, even before COVID-19, were already facing obstacles hampering their growth potential. And Local and regional authorities dealt with persisting problems in establishing public services across borders with different legislative frameworks or even administrative cultures. So we're all determined to face and overcome these obstacles because we know that border regions are a cornerstone of European integration and of the completion of our internal market. EU cohesion policy and the European Territorial Cooperation Program have proven decisive. 
but so has the wish of people to cooperate with their neighbors and to work together in order to build a better common future. For the European Committee of the Regions, and me personally, cross-border cooperation are strong border regions have always been crucial to build a better union. EU treaties task our committee with a specific role to play in this exact respect. And we are determined to put forward comprehensive recommendations on cross-border cooperation as part of the COR's contribution to the Conference on the Future of Europe. After all, great work has been done by the Committee of the Regions all these years. We have President Lamberts, who has contributed much, and we will be able to hear him in a while, and other members of the Committee of the Regions who have worked in this direction. The elaboration of our proposals on the long-term future of cross-border cooperation is an open and inclusive work, and I invite all of you to contribute and participate in this effort that will go on until July next year when we will present our final recommendations. So we want to hear your experiences, your ideas, your needs, and we will shortly be launching public consultations to this purpose. Our proposals will insist on three basic priorities. First, removing obstacles to the provision of cross-border strategic planning services as healthcare, civil protection, sustainable transport, but also tourism, culture, education. Second, legal provisions to maintain, in case of an EU-wide or local crisis, a good level of public services and a satisfactory level of livelihoods for the citizens living in cross-border regions, as well as the smooth functioning of the single market and the respect of the four freedoms so that we never see European borders close again. Third, strengthening ownership and awareness on cross-border cooperation, including through local dialogues, the involvement of the European Union, national, regional and local actors. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is my utmost pleasure to open with you this great conference and to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Platform for the European Groups of Territorial Cooperation alongside the 30 years of the Interreg programs initiatives that have redefined the way we cooperate across borders. As governor Central Macedonia in Greece, I can assure you that these interreg programs have been really helping us develop in these areas where cross-border cooperation is of utmost importance. So the best way to celebrate these achievements is to renew our commitment and clearly acknowledge that the time has come to go further further and beyond, but always together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Titikostas. So with this borders forum, as you can see, we are crossing borders indeed. We were in Portugal, now we are in Greece, and we are soon going to be in this virtual conference. We're going to be back in France with Christian Dupessé, who is the president of MOT. Good morning, Mr. Dupessé. This is the Mission Personnel Transfrontalière. This is a French station specialized in the support provided to cross-border cooperation. You also the mayor of Anmas. So, this is a, a, a this forum is the first of its kind, and you are going to launch a dialogue so for cross-border citizens. You have the floor. Good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Madam Commissioner Ferreira and Mr. President Tsitsikostas for their encouraging words and for their solidarity. I also would like to welcome you, to welcome you 
or who are watching this Borders Forum throughout Europe. Together with uh, the team at MOT, would have uh, very much preferred to welcome you in Paris. But as you know, this was just impossible. And thanks to those new technologies, what we're all experimenting right now, we will still have the possibility to exchange during those two days. I think this has already been said, but I would like to say it again. I believe that the current global health crisis uh, highlights the uh, uh, specificities that our cross-border regions are faced with. I think we would have never thought we would experience the closing of borders uh, inside the EU. Nonetheless, since the spring of 2020, uh, this crisis has turned our world upside down because borders in most of those territories are uh, have no meaning, you know, because those catchment areas are really truly cross-border areas. Uh, so this has had, or is having still, economic consequences uh, uh, on cross-border workers, uh, uh, economic stakeholders, and I think this is going to to be the case in the future. The current crisis has. Uh, uh, exacerbated uh, the difficulties that uh, uh, citizens were faced with in just cross-border regions in order to find a job, to have access to healthcare services, or even to move around. Uh, companies uh, are also faced with uh, hurdles that prevent them from uh, growing their business, and local governments, and I know this uh, in my daily uh, activities, uh, are still faced with many challenges in order to implement cross-border public services. Uh, well, the crisis uh, uh, is all also bringing some positive things about. Uh, it has, for example, uh, stimulated many forms of cooperation. It has highlighted uh, the fact that uh, there can be cross-border solidarity. And this has to be strengthened uh, thanks to European and national public policies that uh, truly recognize the specificities of cross-border regions. Uh, and those uh, uh, cross-border regions have become testing grounds for uh, those new uh, strategies. How can we make sure that those specificities are taken into account from a legal and a regulatory standpoint? And I think that we have to share experiences and speak with one voice. This is how we're going to succeed. So that's the objective of this first borders forum. It aims at showing the central role played by cross-border territories in order to bring together European peoples, lead the way towards a sustainable, inclusive growth and support European integration. We have to convince European and national authorities that cross-border regions have to be at the heart of their action. This is what we're going to do during those two days, uh, during the first day today, in partnership with the EU Commission and the Committee of the Regions uh, uh, and uh, the 10th meeting of the uh, EGTC platform. And tomorrow we will uh, talk more about French territories. But uh, and this is what you asked me to do. Uh, today, we want to make the voice of cross-border regions heard in France and in Europe. And this is the purpose of the European Cross-Border Citizens Alliance. Three of the organizations that represent them, uh, AEBR, CSCI, Central European Service for Cross-Border Initiatives, and the Mission Opérationnelle Transfrontalière, MOT, have uh, had uh, discussions uh, on a regular basis since March, together with DG Regio and the, uh, com the Commission and the Committee of the Regions, in order to put forward this alliance that we are going to discuss today in order to sign this alliance. I'm going to uh, talk about the main pillars of this alliance. First, we want to highlight how important it is uh, to have cross-border cooperation in order to foster the European integration process. We also want to make sure that European cross-border regions uh, really uh, come back at the heart of uh, the uh, EU in terms of its policies, uh, legislation and the budget. We'll also ask the EU to invite cross-border regions and groupings to participate in the Conference of the Future of Europe. And we will support them in order to organize a public consultations so that the point of view of cross-border citizens are also taken into account. Democratization and cross-border cooperation uh, will also take place 
based via cross-border standing councils and maybe inter-regional parliamentary assemblies. We also want cross-border authorities to have the right competencies, dedicated resources and fast-track procedures in order to overcome the obstacles that prevent them from uh, implementing those cross-border projects. And this is just a, a quote from the Franco-German Treaty uh, of Aachen, and, but this should be true for all European uh, borders. Number four, we invite the European Parliament, the Council and the EU Commission to carry out negotiations regarding uh, the draft regulation on the European cross-border mechanism. And uh, we want it to be adopted. We also ask for a similar approach to be adopted for the EU's external borders. We also ask the European institution and local governments, regional and national governments, to remove all legal and administrative hurdles to free movement, to cross-border work and to cross-border public services healthcare services and emergency services, uh, and everything that could benefit citizens who live in those cross-border or border regions. Uh. Number six, uh, the lack of coordination between member states regarding the transposition of uh, the uh, EU legislation, which keeps creating new hurdles. Uh, we recommend that the EU Commission carries out analysis, impact analysis, and examines the impact of the EU legislation on the border region, on the border regions. Uh. And there is also the lack of coordination in the transposition of European law. Number seven, we encourage uh, member states and the regions to implement uh, uh, cross-border observatories in order to monitor cross-border integration and to list and remove cross-border obstacles. Number eight, we invite the EU to establish a solid and efficient framework for public services so that local authorities and member states can support citizens who live in neighbor states by providing them services that are not provided in their own member state at one moment or another. And this would bring a obvious added value to the territorial cohesion of the EU. Number nine, we call for uh, the uh, institutions of the Union and the member states to actively engage in all the phases of the European Green Deal and the next generation EU and future uh, similar policies. Number 10, we also ask all institutions to guarantee a good legislation, a minimum level of cross-border cooperation in case of a crisis, as is the case right now, so that uh, we can guarantee that borders remain open. We want to have harmonized criteria at the European level. So this alliance is being uh, uh, proposed to everyone today, citizens, European institutions, national institutions. Uh, so please come and join us, come and join the Alliance. Uh, Cross-border territories are on the front line of the health crisis and they have and they will be at the heart of Europe in the future. So this is about Europe's future and the citizens have to be uh, really at the heart of those efforts. We're talking about a European integration at the service of its citizens. Uh, we are looking for concrete solutions uh, and I believe this is what we're going to talk about uh, during uh, those few days. Uh, President uh, uh, of Mott, you are talking about this alliance and we'll, you'll stay with us because you will start the discussion with a different institution that will answer this call to join you. It's time to start the first round table after this jingle. We are during the German chairmanship of the Council of the European Union with a new international uh, territorial agenda with a new Leipzig Charter. How can we push cooperation of territories and cross-border cooperation? We will uh, now join our guests that were already there, Elisa Ferreira, European Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms, the President of the European Committee of Regions, 
Nicolas Tsitsikostas, the president of EMOT, Christian Duplessis, and new, two new guests that have joined us in Belgium and Hungary. Karl Heinz Lambert, you are the president of the parliament of a German-speaking community in Belgium and of the Association of European Border Regions. Uh, we are now talking with associations that we haven't heard a lot from. What is your message and uh, will it join the uh, European Cross-Border Citizens Alliance, uh, an alliance that we have talked uh, of the 10 priorities? Mr. Lambert, maybe your mic is on now. Can you hear me? Judith Varga, you are the Hungarian Minister for Justice. Hungary is a part of cross-border trans uh, cooperation outside of the EU with Serbia and Ukraine and also regional uh, cooperation with the V4 group. Uh, do you support the EU cross-border citizens' alliance and how do you support it? Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be among this distinguished uh, company and to take part in this panel. I wish I, would, I could be with you in Paris uh, as we planned uh, earlier uh, this autumn. And thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to uh, uh, be uh, uh, one of uh, the representatives of the member states uh, because in this panel I'm uh, actually representing uh, this uh, level of stakeholders. Uh, as you may all know, Hungary is a very active member already of the European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, factual reasons for that, to be an active part, uh, an active member uh, uh, of this uh, cooperation. Um, just a little uh, lexical data for you on that to, to uh, underpin my statement that Hungary has seven neighboring countries. Actually, we are uh, truly located in Central Europe in the Carpathian Basin, and we have 19 counties, like uh, departments, departments, uh, and out of these 19 counties, we have 14 which are border regions, and uh, <clears throat> that's why we take part in, uh, uh, out of these 19 counties, 15 take part in some kind of cross-border programs. So the cross-border uh, character is a very uh, symbolic and emblematic character of our union membership. And uh, more than 80% of the total Hungarian population live in border areas, uh, unlike the EU average is only 30%. So you can, you can see the uh, big number uh, uh, underpinning our participation. Um, nearly 2.5 million Hungarians are living in the neighboring countries. Also, they're playing a role of, of a bridge between the countries uh, around Hungary and Hungary. And uh, currently, 40 uh, SME uh, towns, uh, small and medium-sized towns, are located along the borders, whose development is, is clearly uh, would be hindered by administrative uh, barriers. But just to broaden the picture, uh, uh, dear participants, uh, dear members of the panel, uh, I think that uh, when it comes to the discussion on the future of Europe, uh, we have to uh, take into consideration that the world's economic and political landscape will undergo profound changes after, after the pandemic. Post-COVID-19, the EU will be entering a hard competition. We must strengthen our geopolitical position, and we are already running out of time, maybe. And to do so, uh, we have to be able to, to respond in a unified and prompt way to the, to the challenges 
and also inside uh, our borders. And we will, it will be essential to, to set Europe's direction on the basis of strong consensus among member states, which reflects citizens' priorities. And I, I see here the essential uh, uh, role on the future of uh, Europe dialogue to uh, include our citizens. And on the other hand, the European institutions have a central role in helping member states the, to identify the areas of cooperation and to facilitate our common work. And uh, there is also a room for improvement in the field of communication with European citizens, as I already said. Uh, this is crucial in order to, to guarantee a truly democratic European Union. And here the Committee of the Regions uh, shall have a significant role in the process of shaping Europe's future together with the European Economic and Social Committee and uh, uh, on the grounds of equality and balance of the institutions. Uh, I don't know how much time do I have uh, for the uh, introductory uh, remarks, but uh, I have so much to say, so uh, just tell me when I have to interrupt myself. And Maybe the discussion with the other, uh, you know, panelists, of course. Alors, Madame, uh, Madame la Commissaire à la, à la uh, Madame, uh, European Commissioner for Cohesion, Elisa Ferrara, you have heard a number of uh, things about uh, the crisis, uh, about uh, the uh, recovery plan of uh, 750 billion euros to fight against uh, the uh, crisis, but. Uh, at, but today, uh, do we want to still promote the territorial approach, give more resources to authorities on the border? Is it something that is still topical today? Yes. So I think uh, we all converge on the relevance and importance of the of the border areas. In fact, uh, there are a lot of varieties of, uh, of situations in border areas. There are external borders, as Minister Judith Vargas just, uh, just referred to. There are internal borders, and we have got to be able to address the situation in one case and the other. Uh, in fact, uh, we have got to, to bring forward the lessons of this crisis, and it was really a very violent thing that all of a sudden, uh, the borders were closed. This is something that had was not in the minds of European people uh, any longer, because we had been for such a long time working together. So what we have to do, in fact, and here we all converge, is to 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 tackle and to stabilize a kind of framework of the relationship across borders that is resilient even when a crisis comes. And the crisis may come from different origins. Uh, and it is, it is a concern of the European uh, Commission, and we have reflected that, uh, that in our recovery, uh, we don't uh, really ignore uh, the, 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 the situation of the border regions. In fact, uh, this requires a kind of uh, local-based approach, a coordination between the regions, but also a specific attention from the member states, because we all know that uh, uh, the, com the, um, the competencies of the Commission in what concerns uh, a management of health crisis, they are very, very limited. And uh, most of the, of the initiatives that were taken, uh, they were the initial reaction of member states to close borders. Uh, and then the work that was done, and it was an incredible work then at the Commission level, in order to progressively open up the borders, have green lights, have a public common procurement of uh, essential equipment. This was done much more on a kind of... Uh, of coordinating and the goodwill basis that then on a true legal basis because in fact it is still at the level of the of the member states uh, that uh, that these kind of actions for health protection are managed this is the reason why uh, i i really i really confirm that uh, uh, the and and uh, uh, also uh, president uh, uh, Tizi Costas and uh, and uh, and the minister and the minister Judith Varga they 
they merge this this uh, the, the role of this uh, of this agenda within the context of the discussion of the future of europe and it was clear in the discussion by the and in the presentation of the state of the union uh, speech by uh, by the president of the union uh, that uh, that uh, we have got to reflect on a broader uh, sense uh, what is the competence of the of the commission in such circumstances uh, now in the second wave we already <laughs> have uh, much more flexibility much more recognition uh, that you cannot uh, that you don't gain anything by locking yourself in so you have to cooperate uh, the second issue I'd like to address relates to, nevertheless, I also think that uh, what we are discussing requires that at the level of the different regions and regional authorities that we create and we start working very seriously on a kind of sharing of, um, of, uh, of a common understanding also for in crisis situation. Uh, in crisis situation, uh, there are certain freedoms that have got to be respected and some sort, uh, a, a, cert, uh, a minimum level of public services have got to go on, even in a crisis situation. For this, we need a lot of detailed work between regions, cross regions, but also we need that the member states recognize the role and what is happening in these regions. Because we, uh, at the Commission level, we checked and we realized that uh, some, of some of these lockdowns at the border level, they were not even uh, discussed or coordinated with regional authorities. We can understand that in panic, uh, countries had to react immediately. But in fact, uh, this is something that was not uh, really prepared and some regions and some citizens they just overnight they realized that they could not cross the border anymore even if they lived on one side of the border and worked on the other side and so this this was really a very unfortunately unfortunate so uh, i think there is a lot of work that can be done on details uh, on in uh, uh, crisis uh, preparedness and uh, and i think uh, for the future programs the commission is uh, completely interested in uh, within uh, interreg and within the normal cohesion funding to address these issues there is also and you mentioned it uh, that uh, there is this relaunch and so when we think not in short term not in an emergency case in a kind of kind of approach of course again we have got to see the border as something that may be there but the more we can uh, forget it and uh, build together something that is for the benefit of the communities both sides of the of the border the best and of course uh, the we also are working on european cross border mechanisms that can really stabilize some sort of common understanding that can resist this kind of crisis so there is a lot of work to be done in the future the commission is very attentive and by the way i'm speaking from brussels from my office you say you mentioned portugal no i'm not in portugal i'm in brussels uh, and in my in my office uh, in the european commission Yes, yes, and uh, to add to uh, the discussion this morning, which is very interesting on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the borders uh, with uh, countries that uh, with panic uh, sometimes had to uh, put in place new uh, internal borders, restore them, but it didn't stop the virus. And uh, cooperation was necessary uh, uh, against uh, the pandemic. Karl Heinz Lambert, you are the president of the parliament of the German speaking community in Belgium. Uh, the end of the Association of European Borders Regions. You are with us uh, this morning. What is the message of your association uh, faced with this virus that uh, questions borders? And uh, why uh, do you want to join the European Cross-Border Citizen Alliance? Oui, l'importance uh, des frontières uh, n'est pas... Uh, the importance of borders uh, today uh, has existed for a very long time 
and uh, the association uh, today will uh, celebrate its 50th anniversary and this half century has been a history of borders in Europe uh, on this uh, continent of Europe which is a bit bigger than Australia is a continent with the highest number of national borders and uh, with European integration it is a uh, uh, very uh, working to overcome these borders, borders that are uh, uh, being transformed as a tool for European cohesion. But what is to be said clearly is that uh, uh, when uh, a crisis happened, whether it is the uh, attacks, uh, terrorist attacks in 2015 or uh, the COVID-19 crisis, what happens? What is the, the reflex? Well, it is to close the borders. And uh, this reflex is still very present today, although uh, the real problem that to overcome those problems, we would have to overcome borders as well, to cooperate uh, beyond borders and uh, create bridges. This has to be done, but it's done only partially. But uh, what we see is that uh, a large number of European officials and civil society representatives and uh, politicians are convinced that we can only succeed tomorrow when we cooperate more. And that's a true hope today. And uh, that's also the meaning of this uh, European Cross-Border Citizens Alliance. And that's why this alliance is very important. And I would like to thank MOT for uh, creating this alliance with its partners. It is essential. And I hope that will allow us to really look uh, at the problems of tomorrow even better than we did until now. Um, thank you. Now, I would like uh, to uh, talk about MOT and in your regions, do you think that the COVID-19 crisis has strengthened uh, European uh, cross-border uh, cooperation or is it uh, the cross-border uh, is, is suspected of really uh, improving the work of the virus and maybe not giving uh, as much place to uh, the, the, the work to fight the virus. What I think, and uh, I would like uh, really to use my experience as a local uh, elected official in uh, international binational uh, metropolis, uh, although uh, Switzerland is not a member of the European Union, but it is a part of the Schengen area, and we have uh, permanent uh, relations with uh, Switzerland. And the crisis that we had in March and April showed what shouldn't be done. And I think that brutally borders were closed without asking for uh, the uh, advice of uh, elected officials in France or in Switzerland, people who really know the situation. And what we said is that uh, there would be an economic impact, but there will also be an impact on the life of the cross-border workers. We saw, uh, for example, uh, um, the situations where a father would uh, give uh, uh, the child to its mother on the other side of the border. And that's really a shock uh, that happened in those regions. And what's very interesting is that we have really learned uh, from it and we had uh, positive consequences from it. In this uh, second uh, wave of uh, the pandemic today, the choice of leaving the borders open was taken uh, by France and Switzerland, and we are very happy of it. And we have uh, created even closer links uh, between uh, the elected officials on both sides of the borders to try to see what were the policies to take, but also to coordinate those policies and ensure uh, territorial uh, coherence. 
And what happened is that the people in these regions and in other regions as well really realized that they lived in the same living area. And as strange as it could be, as it might seem, the uh, crisis actually strengthened the cross border identity in a positive way. And uh, I think that's uh, what uh, we should really learn from this crisis, really remember. Uh, we don't. We shouldn't uh, work on a ad hoc basis now. We shouldn't have a direct reaction to a problem, but rather to adopt a global vision. And what we want to say is never again, never again, brutal uh, measures. But what we need is a true cross-border policy and a true uh, policy for crisis periods. It's something that's uh, possible. Solidarity at the health level, uh, for example, it exists. We know uh, that it exists uh, between uh, Belgium and Germany and France, uh, and we know that it exists in uh, with Switzerland as well. It's something that is very important. But beyond this type of solidarity, there is also a real will to have a, a common vision that really integrates citizens in uh, the process and uh, the cross-border identity, the European identity will be strengthened, can be strengthened by this crisis. Uh, thank you. Judith Varga, uh, Minister of Justice in Hungary, your president, uh, Viktor Orban, was uh, suspected of wanting to re-establish uh, European borders at the time of a migration crisis in 2015 or of the health crisis of COVID-19 uh, in 2020, did the pandemic really change your vision of borders? Uh, we have seen that it is uh, really necessary that uh, free circulation exists between borders for health reasons and that we saw that the lockdown should happen in the cities, in the houses, but it's not a question of border. Thank you very much for the question. Actually, I would uh, truly separate the two uh, issues like migration or uh, the pandemic uh, because they are all uh, different uh, challenges in their nature. And Hungary has been advocating uh, before the COVID crisis uh, generally for the truly restoration of the Schengen area for a long time. We always uh, um, uh, advocated in the European fora that uh, internal borders must be uh, lifted uh, and uh, we must Schengen fully uh, operate to let Schengen operate fully and for that the precondition is a very strong external border protection so it, it has a, a two uh, side uh, of this policy to have a very strong external border protection so that so that inside the Schengen zone uh, there will be a very free circulation of goods, services and people without uh, the less uh, uh, limitations. And then came COVID and of course uh, COVID uh, made an unprecedented challenge to every country in Europe, especially in the first wave in the springtime. And um, it was uh, all EU countries faced an extremely demanding uh, situation and uh, we were also facing an unknown uh, challenge. Now we know a lot more about uh, the COVID, about the pandemic. And let me remind you that uh, during the summer months, when we had a little easing of the situation, when uh, numbers were uh, going down uh, early summer, Hungary was among the first member states to, to lift all internal border controls in order to ensure the, the free circulation of the persons and goods and services. And then when, when the second wave came, uh, then there was a, a professional decision uh, based on a scientific uh, opinion because there is a body, uh, the so-called operative body, uh, helping the government to make decisions during the COVID pandemic concerning health uh, issues, but also uh, border uh, uh, mechanisms and, and border measurement uh, issues. And then that's why uh, there was a reintroduction of uh, early uh, measures uh, but uh, I have to also emphasize that there are a lot of uh, exceptions uh, to this, uh, especially when there was uh, the V4 uh, expression, uh, exception for uh, member states uh, coming uh, for, for citizens coming from the uh, V4 countries. There was a, an exception uh, to these uh, controls, but uh, this is ceased to exist at, at the end of October, so it's not uh, in effect anymore. 
and we have also all these uh, uh, concessions concerning the intra-company travel, also the commuters uh, uh, concessions in border areas. And let me here just give you a couple of uh, concrete examples how uh, Hungary tackled the pandemic in terms of cross-border mobility. Uh, in the majority of our borders, uh, the, the mobility of workers was ensured along the Hungarian borders with a distance limit of 30 kilometer between the residence and the working place of, of the commuter. And it was working very smoothly. And I also have to remind you that I was also in a, on a regular basis, for example, with my Austrian colleague, uh, Ms. Karolina Echtadler, uh, before each and every uh, uh, measure was, was introduced. Similarly, also the government allowed the cross-border movement of those landholders uh, who were aiming to cultivate the arable lands or vineyards, so they could also have this uh, cross-border uh, uh, commuting possibility. Uh, and we were also very cooperative in uh, helping uh, neighboring countries with protecting tools like masks, pulmonary ventilators, disinfectants. During the first wave already, our government transported such tools to the neighboring uh, countries, like 600,000 masks, several 10,000s of protecting uh, clothing and tests, and also to the Balkan countries, so those countries who are not yet uh, members, like the Serbia, we provided 200,000 masks, and also to Croatia, uh, North Macedonia, so Croatia is also a member already, but uh, uh, he's a neighboring country. And just uh, during the second wave, let me also uh, tell you that Hungary fared uh, uh, pulmonary ventilators to Czechia, and we just sent uh, 200 young doctors and nurses to Slovakia in order to facilitate the mass testing uh, over there. And final uh, remark uh, that uh, the Hungarian EGTCs during the pandemic provided a lot of information on the actual border regime, collected masks, disinfectants and transporting them to the neighboring countries. For example, the Gate to Europe EGTC conducted a survey on the impacts of the pandemic and these results were published also on the COVID-19 website of the Committee of the Regions, uh, also with the assistance of the CESC. So uh, the EGTC has proved to work uh, well, and uh, but uh, all in all, uh, maybe in a later uh, stage or another question, I can return uh, to a larger extent to our policy on migration and external border protection, which I think it's uh, it's crucial. Uh, but I stop here and. Parce qu'il y a des questions là-dessus, bien sûr. Euh, vous estimez, pardon, votre Premier ministre, hein, bien sûr, ce n'est pas votre président, euh, Victor Orban, mais votre Premier ministre a été très coopératif, dites-vous, euh, sur la question des frontières. Euh, tout de même, M. Tsitsikostas, euh, c'est le risque quand même avec ce, ce coronavirus. Hein, Mr. Tsitsikostas, uh, the risk with this uh, coronavirus is that, uh, uh, you know, with this pandemic, uh, we are going into lockdowns and then easing of lockdowns and lockdowns again in Greece. So the current lockdown is quite strict, very strict indeed. And this truly prevents free movement between countries. It prevents cross-border workers to go to the other side because of lack of transportation. So what about this idea of abolishing, of removing borders within the EU? Well, um, as I said earlier in my intervention, in my opinion, the last thing that Europe needs today is closed borders. Closed borders should not be implemented within the European Union by any means, for no reason. No crisis is strong enough to close our borders. And this is my opinion concerning all member states and the way we intervene and the way we look and deal with uh, crisis today or in the future, whether it is the coronavirus pandemic or the migration crisis. And uh, to be very frank, I, I must say that uh, so far today, um, there were countries that uh, chose to close borders during both crises, the migration crisis, which is a European issue and it should be dealt this way. Uh, there should be no country left alone in dealing with the migration crisis. And I think that uh, the European Union is here for that. It's based on solidarity. And solidarity is the main idea uh, where we are founding this great union of ours. And in coronavirus pandemic, again, we saw some countries willing to close their borders. However, it's not 
with less Europe that we can give answers to this crisis. It's with more Europe. And more Europe comes with open borders, with cross-border collaboration. Uh, as governor of the region of uh, Central Macedonia, I have worked tirelessly with uh, border regions uh, on the other side of our borders, whether they are European Union, like Bulgaria, or not. And uh, we have come up with uh, great results using European funds, using uh, best practices. We created as Committee of Regions, uh, after my election as president, we entered the phase with the coronavirus crisis directly, but uh, we managed to create a, a platform where uh, regions could uh, discuss, exchange best practices, ideas, proposals, and this was very helpful to each other. So in other words, of course I understand that there might be some difficulties, for example, with the workers that try to go from one region to another uh, in cross-border areas. However, the European Union must envisage these issues and give concrete results and results that would be implemented by all countries and all cross-border regions. Again, the answer to the crisis, to any crisis, cannot be less Europe. It's only with more Europe and deepening our collaboration that we can give answers to these real crises that we are facing. Thank you. So more Europe, uh, Mr. Lambetz. Uh, you are really looking forward to the Conference on the Future of Europe. And uh, we are going to think about what this means for citizens. So it's not just about the 2 million of cross-border workers uh, or 30 million of citizens who live in cross-border areas. But are you also able to talk to the other people who don't live in those regions, 430 million people, citizens? Maybe it's difficult to have them be uh, interested in those cross-border issues, free movement, etc., on a daily basis. Yes, indeed. Free movement is definitely something that uh, concerns those people who live in those cross-border regions. But it would be a major mistake if we only thought that only those people living in those areas are impacted by cross-border collaboration. As I was telling you earlier, uh, you know, the EU is very small compared with other continents. So that everything that has to be solved, uh, especially in Europe, uh, almost always has a cross-border dimension. That's the reason why the removal of internal borders is so important. It is the essence of the EU and of the EU construct. This is why we needed to have uh, uh, this policy, uh, this common policy with uh, those borders and external borders sometimes are a difficult issue to deal with. But if we work together, we will be able to uh, move forward. And I fully agree with President Tsitsikostas. He's telling us that we need more Europe. I agree with him, but it's not just about having more Europe for the sake of it. No, we need more Europe when we will no longer be able to find adequate solutions uh, if we don't uh, take into account this uh, continental dimension and be it cross-border regions or other regions, uh, all local governments on this continent uh, have an extremely important role to play. This is the third dimension of the European institutional model. This is where you establish a link with the European citizen. That citizen lives in a region, be it a cross-border region or not, but the citizen has to be convinced that what is happening where that person lives uh, is actually uh, a better uh, a better thing you know it's better if if it's done uh, in a similar way throughout europe and this is really something that we need to focus on i think that the regions really have a uh, 
a twin role to play. You know, those cross-border regions are really uh, like uh, testing grounds. This is where you can try out things, but it's also a powerful engine. It is also going to help us move forward. This is the reason why we really need to strengthen the relations, the links between those cross-border regions, because uh, decision makers in the capital cities of the various states don't always necessarily uh, sufficiently take into account what takes place, what is going on in those cross-border regions, but it's up to us to make them aware of this. So more Europe. I think this is what uh, people have been uh, asking for during this COVID crisis. Uh, so, uh, you don't really have a lot of confidence in terms of in healthcare, but people have asked you to have more competencies because uh, there was a need for medical equipment. Uh, there was also a need for uh, travel solutions uh, between European countries. We are seeing some reactions uh, in the audience. Uh, let's build uh, a EU with a true federal policy and a true common asylum and uh, integration policy. Also, uh, so how do you see the future of the Schengen area? This was a second question. So do you think that this Schengen area is going to be revalidated after COVID, no, when this time comes, or will it be more fragile? Hello? So, do you think, can you hear me? Uh, is it a question to me? Sorry. Okay. Asking the commissioner, oh, okay. uh, do you think that the Schengen area is going to be validated again by this COVID crisis? Uh, this a uh, question that was asked by some people in the audience. Okay, so, what about I, the future of the Schengen area? This is a question asked okay. by Emila. Okay, I, I, I didn't understand that question was addressed to me. I'm sorry. Um, well, I think I think it must be. You cannot imagine. Uh, I mean, this uh, what we have built together, and now being put in uh, in question. And of course, the Schengen area is there. Uh, we, if we think of the interest of the different member states, also they. They they reflected. They learned from the lessons uh, due, uh, in the first uh, in the first wave because all of a sudden they realized that it was against their interest to have closed borders because uh, the the food could not pass through, the the workers could not pass through. Uh, there is an international. We are all interconnected. So there were injuries that needed pieces and raw materials and they could not pass through. And so it was, uh, uh, there were, there was, uh, for instance, uh, uh, medical and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of equipment uh, that, uh, that were inside of the border and was needed in the other one. And so it was the, often, I mean, all of a sudden you, you realized that you had really uh, to accept uh, this uh, opening of borders, uh, which does mean that you don't have, and we have it inside the uh, the, the, the countries uh, that that you 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 have to confine a certain city or a certain area, but for health reasons, not because there is there is a border. So the different the difference is if we address everybody along the same criterion. Uh, and it is an objective need to confine a certain area and you treat equally the the conditions, uh, I mean, the health conditions of, of people moving from the different areas. So the criterion is based on objective data and not on, on preference or political preference or on uh, any sort of other of other criterion. And so uh, I think this, this was a, a very important lesson and uh, of course uh, now we are we are dealing on a different second wave uh, because because it is in self interest of member states also uh, to to recognize it uh, I, I think this is one of the lessons learned but my second topic about this is that more and more cooperation in the sense of more europe of course 
is needed for all the challenges that we have. We don't have challenges at the national level. We have challenges at the European and global level. And the, you have the need for cooperation when forest fires start in the summer. You have the need for cooperation when you have uh, migrants moving around. You, have, you need the cooperation when there is organized global crime and money laundering. So uh, all the issues that we are faced with in terms of the globalization and the climate challenges and crime and terrorists, they cannot be addressed at the level of uh, a single member state uh, or a single region. So we need more cooperation, more intelligent cooperation, and of course, definitely more Europe, and Schengen has got to be there uh, with much more information, much more cooperation, so that uh, uh, on our common values, we can address our common uh, challenges and then our, our common risks. Uh, and, uh, and the risks are higher and higher. Madame Varga, so, Mrs. Varga, more Europe. This is not necessarily what uh, your country says. In Hungary, uh, you are more in favor of uh, Europe of the nations. So, I'm not sure you are going to be uh, very much in favor of that idea. So, I think you were personally impacted by coronavirus. You're going to tell us about this. So, do you think that with this pandemic, that uh, is uh, having a major impact on European citizens. They've been thinking about this uh, for almost a year now. Uh, so you think that financial solidarity towards impacted regions, uh, uh, employment support schemes or other types of schemes, do you think that cross-border cooperation for people who are sick, for example, when a neighbor country welcomes uh, uh, citizens uh, in their hospitals, if uh, hospitals are full in the other country, do you think that this is going to play a role in the second wave? And how do you see things? And when you hear more Europe, aren't you just uh, saying, oh, no, 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 we don't want more Europe. So what do you think about this? It's okay now. Sorry. Uh, so you had you had so many ideas uh, formulated in your questions that maybe I'm, I'm afraid it, it takes more time for me to respond to all the aspects what you just said. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your question concerning my health uh, status. I actually just recovered from coronavirus. It impacted all my family, so we were quarantined with three little children. It was quite a challenge. Actually, I, I'm uh, relaxing more when working than being at home with, with the children. Uh, but of course, uh, it was a very uh, valuable experience, not only because uh, uh, you know what is going uh, on uh, with this new virus, but also I also saw on my skin uh, the impact of all the national measures. So when the authorities are working, how smoothly they are functioning in your everyday lives. And my experience can be channeled into the government's everyday decisions. This is my, my personal remark. Of course, uh, uh, great mind think alike. You just uh, mentioned uh, more Europe. Uh, uh, I just wanted to react, of course, on that because the Hungarian position has always been uh, uh, reluctant towards this more Europe because it, it echoes the ever uh, deeper union and ever uh, closer union concept, which uh, we were always uh, concerning about. Uh, we think that uh, we need a safer and a larger Europe. Uh, so that's why enlargement is a key uh, policy uh, in our European policy. We are fully on board together with Austria uh, for the sooner accession of the Western Balkan countries. Um, and that's why uh, we are always a big advocate of, uh, of the Western Balkan accession talks. Thanks God we have our commissioner uh, on the right place. Mr. Varhe is actually uh, in charge of, of this policy field. And as I said in my earlier intervention, that we provided uh, also a lot of uh, medical equipment and, uh, and uh, healthcare uh, equipment uh, during pandemic, showing also our very rap rapid cooperation uh, uh, willingness. Sorry? I cannot hear you. Thank you very much. I need to tell our audience that uh, you have many residents uh, in the border, in, in the neighbor country, so maybe Hungarian citizens who live in neighbor countries. I just wanted to remind the audience of this. This is the reason why cross-border issues are so important for you. I just wanted to mention this because not everyone is always necessarily aware of okay. your situation. Now, yes. Now, in those countries, now, you have lots of uh, borders and there are many citizens who 
live in other countries, neighbour countries. Yes, thank you very much for this very uh, valuable remark. Uh, of course, uh, this is for historic reasons, but after the First World War, Hungary actually lost two thirds of its territory. And with that one third of uh, the five million Hungarians just got outside of the Hungarian borders. And still today, uh, across Hungarian borders in the neighboring uh, territories, we have 2.5 million Hungarians living. So it means that uh, in the country we have uh, 10 million and, and outside. So it's, it's quite a, a big uh, proportion. And that's why for us, uh, cross-border uh, cooperation, especially uh, with the accession to the European uh, integration, uh, our thinking has widened because we are all in the same big uh, community now and cross-border uh, cooperation had a, had a different meaning. But uh, let me come back to, uh, to your previous uh, question on, on, uh, on more Europe. Uh, we always actually would like to advocate just uh, to preserve for the preservation of the framework what we joined and there are shared competencies of the European integration and there are also uh, competencies which still belong to to national sovereignty, we would, we would like to preserve this kind of status quo. So we are, not, of course, not in favor of a federalist union. This is this may be a minority opinion, but I think still a, a valid opinion. Uh, and when it comes to the Schengen area, uh, as I said before, Hungary remains truly committed to to maintaining the functioning of the Schengen zone, and uh, we also hope that. Uh, the necessary measures will be taken in order to eliminate uh, the prolonged internal borders that lack any legal basis because we do not have to forget that uh, before the pandemic there were already uh, internal border controls introduced in, in many member states especially in western member states so if you travel through from hungary to belgium for example there were because of the migratory crisis a uh, lot of internal controls uh, introduced and uh, we think that uh, this prolongation should be uh, reviewed uh, after the pandemic because there is uh, uh, no legal basis or it's quite a lack of legal basis to keep those uh, internal uh, Schengen uh, control uh, uh, measures uh, because we, we are uh, promoters of the robust external border protection, which would be key. And just a few remarks about external border protection. For us, it translates to the protection of our common values because we think that uh, the protection of Europe's external borders can contribute to providing a, a sense of a safety for European citizens internally. Externally borders can strengthen internal integrity, which now during COVID is, is more important uh, than ever. Of course, migration uh, remains one of the most divisive questions between member states, uh, but uh, Hungarian position has always been a pro-European position, but we think that uh, Solidarity must be flexible and not only thinking up about uh, compulsory relocation, but also uh, uh, the protection, for example, of the external borders for which Hungary has uh, contributed a lot, not only in financial, but also in, in uh, effective human power uh, sense. Uh, we would like to, to have a respect for these kind of uh, solidarity as well. And just three points, protection of external borders, stemming uh, illegal migration and tackling the root causes of migration. These are the cornerstones uh, of our migration policy. And I see your hand, so I stop here. No, no. Yes, I just wanted to add something. Mr. Tsitsikostas, you spoke about uh, the need for solidarity in the face of those migratory issues uh, and the fact that uh, refugees uh, should be uh, distributed amongst countries. Uh, and this is something maybe that uh, uh, is, has to be dealt with by the Commission uh, also. And it's also about the cohesion fund. So it's a, it's a global discussion. It's a very important discussion that is currently uh, underway. Also, I would like to talk about something a bit more specific, because here we're talking about long-term issues. But Mr. Dupissy, I would like to ask you a question regarding the uh, important economic uh, challenge. How come those cross-border regions are often much more fragile from a, an economic point of view than other regions? Is this what we call the border effect? And this is something that people are not necessarily aware of. Those border regions are usually more fragile from a, a, an economic point of view. And how do you want to overcome this? Well, this is quite paradoxical. And uh, you're right in when you highlight this. 
we have to be able to truly take advantage of the uh, development potential of those border regions. Right now, this potential is uh, uh, hampered by all sorts of obstacles that have already been put forward. When it works, we are able to achieve exceptional outcomes. Uh, let me talk about the Franco-Geneva region, which I know very well. We have just uh, established an important investment in order to revisionize mobility. We have a, a cross-border train, a commuting train that uh, goes from the Haute Savoie to the Geneva region. Uh, this allows us to uh, have a good development in those regions. In order to do this, you have to have a good balance on both sides of the border. In other words, you really have to strike the right balance in terms of development. You have to make sure that one country is not going to eat up the other region, if you will. And this is what we need to do, and this is what we are currently doing, I believe. There is also this idea, this very strong idea, uh, that uh, no one should be left behind in our regions. Uh, and even in a region that is probably clinically a bit more favored than others, uh, you really have to have some cohesion and some solidarity because not everyone has the same living standards. For example, in my municipality, 40,000 inhabitants, my municipality is seen as one of the municipalities in France where there is the highest level of inequalities. And I believe that this is the reason why Europe, and I'm very much in favor of what I've heard regarding more Europe, having more Europe. I believe that Europe, by relying on the, what is going on underground by uh, listening more to the actors who are in those border regions by uh, giving people the possibility to make decisions at the local level we should be able to develop those cross-border regions further now we talked about as testing ground or we also talked about uh, areas that uh, contribute to the development of the EU. And I believe that cross-border regions, border regions, are really a great opportunity to strengthen EU citizenship, that cross-border citizenship that becomes a, a European citizenship. I believe this is something that's concrete. I think we're going to succeed. This is going to be a win-win situation, and no one will be left behind. Uh, we will uh, allow those regions to have more resources, uh, to be heard, and we are going to be able to remove administrative hurdles. Uh, we will also also have the conference on the future of Europe and the French presidency in 2022 uh, will make sure that uh, we focus on this. And I believe that uh, with this border forum today, we are going to focus on regions that are really the great opportunity for Europe, the opportunity for European integration, and that opportunity will be uh, will turn into a reality because we will be able to make sure that citizens are at the heart of this approach, and we want to make sure that things are going in a bottom-up approach and not just a top-down approach. You have to make sure that you're able to listen to citizens and this is what is going to allow us to move uh, forward. And uh, we also uh, avoid having uh, those fragile border regions in order to help them realize the true potential. There are a number of uh, questions for you. What is uh, the impact on uh, jobs uh, that happens through uh, the closing of borders. A question from Benoit Bilot and from Ben, an other question to experts that you are, obviously. A question about the concept of borders based on territories. Is it a concept in crisis, Mr. Lambert or Titi Costas? Who wants to answer? Uh, 
voulez répondre. Quel impact sur l'emploi ou une notion What do uh, you want uh, to answer this uh, concept of uh, of uh, borders on territories? Is it in crisis? Mr. President of the Committee of the Regions, do you want to answer this question? Mr. Titicostas, we are listening to you. Yes, can you please specifically, well, what was the question? I didn't get it. So the question, again, I'm asking it, it's a question for experts. Does this concept, the classical concept of borders, which is based on the idea of territory, is it a concept that is in crisis? Is it a concept that no, it is, is not. difficult today? Not at all. Not at all, I would say. If you're asking me if open borders are undermining state sovereignty, I would tell you not at all. It is, an, in fact, enhancing their prospects by strengthening their economies through trade and, and through other economic cooperation. It also allowed EU states to focus their resources on their priorities by redeploying their staff from borders to other more pertinent postings. Uh, however, it is important that our external borders are well protected, of course, in order to be able to have open borders within the European Union. Um, so, no, I don't see any issues with uh, state sovereignty, with open bo borders of the European Union. Mr. Lambert, uh, Benoit Villot is asking, what is the impact on uh, jobs uh, from closing borders? Well, it depends on the situation where there is a high level of mobility on the job market. This impact is really catastrophic. People have uh, high difficulties very suddenly uh, to pursue uh, their work on the other side of uh, the border. Uh, the opportunities for finding, creating new jobs disappear and uh, everything is becoming very difficult when the borders are closed uh, compared to when the borders are opened. But uh, this uh, idea of border is still very important even when they have disappeared because uh, there are different systems existing. When I go on the other side of the border when there is no control, there is still a new legal uh, system in place and I only really realize that when I have a problem and there are uh, borders that still exist in the mind of people and that might be the borders that are uh, the most difficult to overcome because we saw that there were very difficult experiences when uh, borders uh, suddenly closed, people were still able to, to cross them because they want to go to a shop or they want to go to do something else in the other country and then there is aggression that reappears and so what we should really do is to maintain the borders is open, then do everything that we can to uh, ensure that uh, it isn't difficult to cross the border. And once again, and it's linked to the second question, there is a, a balancing act to maintain. Because the idea of territory, this concept of territory, is being modified by uh, communication and globalization. But there is something that is essential. People don't live on the internet, they don't live online or in satellites. They live somewhere, in a village, in a city, in a region. And this anchoring is very important, but it shouldn't be an argument to, for exclusion. It has to be an anchoring that re really allows you to be open to the outside and this is this exchange between t those two dimensions that is really the strength of Europe and what uh, we need is more Europe uh, but we also need common values in Europe and there is still a lot of work to do when you read uh, the last report of the Commission on this, uh, the rule of law in Europe uh, for example you see that there's a lot of work to do but we have to go forward and we have to overcome borders every day. Uh, the question that I want to ask now is also a question from a viewer. Uh, in 2021, the British people will be uh, uh, exiting the EU. There will be only 27 member countries. The borders are changing. Uh, will we uh, have a trans uh, maritime uh, project? That is my question to you, uh, Ms. Commissioner. 
Uh, and if there is a question in English as well from Amandine. Operation in the Channel area, given the new external border situation and Brexit-related uh, impacts on economy and everyday life, qui va un peu dans le même sens. Yes. Well. Um I think I think this is a, a, a crucial element, as I referred in uh, in my initial in in my initial speech, because in fact uh, uh, this uh, I mean uh, UK, I mean the process of negotiation, as you know, is uh, is still going on, but uh, but the UK has already informed that uh, that they would like to keep uh, one cooperation program and this is the peace program between Ireland and and the UK uh, for reconciliation peace stability and we are very glad at the Commission uh, that this is kept but on the other hand there was an, uh, a substantial number of, uh, of programs that were going on uh, covered by interreg and uh, the UK uh, is not interested in uh, in going on with them. Uh, which they could have gone uh, in uh, uh, as uh, as uh, as we have uh, uh, this possibility uh, to to have uh, this uh, cooperation with uh, with uh, Norway or with Switzerland, and this was an alternative kind of uh, of approach to the issue. So, of course, the Commission is looking very carefully at uh, at. Um, the way in which to address uh, the continuation of such programs, others can uh, has got to be mass have got to be massively uh, refitted, so to speak, in order to see and to check if the substance of this cooperation can go on without a big partner like the UK. On the other hand, uh, you know that there was this decision at the council level that uh, there would be an extra instrument for support inside Europe uh, for the regions more, most affected and countries most affected by, by Brexit. And the Commission is working on this proposal. Uh, it was, uh, we'll try to produce it even during the month of November. So uh, things change over time. Let's see if, in the longer run, we can uh, we can really uh, address uh, uh, or reestablish uh, a more fruitful cooperation because it's uh, it's really very welcome, particularly when you are dealing with the Atlantic coast and the the western part of Europe, western and northern part of Europe. So. Uh, let's see how things evolve. But uh, let me just uh, use this, uh, I mean, this opportunity to speak in order to underline what Monsieur uh, Christian Dupessy has said uh, on when we are addressing this uh, interregional cooperation, how much it is important to understand that one size doesn't fit all. You have cooperation between regions that are very, very prosperous. There are regions that are very weak. Uh, and there are regions uh, that have completely different uh, strength across in one side and the other side of the border. So from the Commission side, we have got to be very careful because often frontiers were established on the basis of conflicts. And so all this work has got to be done. And the other element that was, uh, um, that was mentioned by uh, by Mr. Karl Heinz uh, Lambert, uh, that is that uh, sometimes, and it is the, the I mean the normal situation is that the legal and the administrative rules they are in themselves different. And what the Commission is proposing uh, the European cross-border mechanism, I mean trying to establish the, uh, a norm uh, on which on uh, on which grounds if there is a conflict if there is a, uh, the, an operation that works on both sides of the frontier uh, can work. And last, of course, uh, I agree, uh, and the Commission is very much aware that, uh, that uh, we have got to have uh, uh, management of the outside border that is careful. Uh, but for this, we have got, and the Commission has just established uh, proposals for the management of migration and uh, and for the management of other critical issues. So the, the, the concept is that we have got to establish 
common understandings based on European values. And these European values include not leaving anyone behind and a humanitarian approach. And then on the basis of those values, of course, we manage our outside world, but we can never uh, reflect our national approaches into internal borders because uh, this is common principles require common ways and cooperative ways to address the common challenges that we have to face. And I just uh, gave some examples of what in the globalized world we have to face. There is no way individually we can tackle terrorism, we can tackle um, earthquakes, we can tackle, uh, I mean, hurricanes, we can tackle uh, floods, or we can tackle terrorism or money laundering or organized crime. So we have got to be together on top or on the basis of our common values and uh, manage in common what we have to manage. And this is the line that the Commission is proposing. Very, very good. Uh, there aren't any borders uh, for terrorism, uh, for climate change as well, and uh, and also when it comes to uh, change in temperatures uh, uh, and also very difficult weather uh, uh, events. Uh, no borders for viruses. Maybe an answer from uh, Judith Varga and also a question from our viewers. Madam Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Is this going to be my final contribution? Okay. okay. Yes, very, very quickly. Okay, so we are at the end. It's a, it's a huge challenge. Uh, well, shortly on Brexit, uh, we shortly uh, say usually that uh, the problem uh, of the previous commission, and I do hope that this current pro uh, commission will not uh, enter the same uh, error or mistake anymore, that uh, uh, Europe was not able to take uh, or to keep Brits in and uh, to halt uh, illegal migration, so to keep migrants out. So this is a, this is a very short uh, sentence, uh, but we should learn also from a democratic point of view, because also when you look at Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union, it starts uh, listing the European values, where freedom, democracy, are the first two uh, uh, or among the first uh, uh, two words and then uh, this is very important to uh, have uh, still the respect for uh, national identities and for the decision of uh, the citizens so this is democracy and uh, there must be a smart integration like you mentioned uh, climate change terrorism of course they are all uh, subject matters where we need to have a common European approach, otherwise we, we, we are not able to succeed because of the nature of the program. But still, uh, the national identity and the preservation of this historical constitutional identity and democracy are also European values which, which need to be protected at the same level. And short note on cohesion, I fully agree with, uh, with Madam Commissioner uh, that cohesion uh, is still a key policy in the European Union. We are very happy that uh, during the July EU co-summit, we were able together uh, with the cohesion uh, friends, uh, uh, group of friends of countries to protect uh, the financing level uh, at a very good uh, ratio. It's not an outdated policy. It's still a very valid and actual policy and we need to uh, protect it and nobody should be left behind. Thank you very much. I'm now asking a question for all of you, uh, and you can all uh, react to this uh, question. It is a very valid question about this uh, European Cross-Border Citizens Alliance. There are question on uh, learning cross-border citizenship. Who is uh, for uh, this uh, cross-border citizens alliance uh, uh, you can uh, maybe uh, give us a show of hand uh, who is for this initiative uh, among you maybe you can raise your hand if you if you want this initiative i think uh, madame varga says that it is she's for it um, you see that this initiative has been uh, adopted by our guests thank you very much for being uh, with us uh, for this very uh, interesting uh, discussion and you are staying uh, with us obviously the viewers
members are staying with us. Uh, we'll have a second round table very soon. Uh, but now we would like to thank the guests for uh, being with us today. And we will have a very short coffee break for uh, 15 minutes. And then in 15 minutes, we'll have a round table on the uh, tools to implement an effective cross-border policy uh, with us. Uh, we'll have ministers, uh, MEPs, a uh, president of Eurometropoles and uh, director generals will be with you in 15 minutes. Thank you to our guests.